You're listening to Always Building. Here we go. Welcome to the uh, the Always Building podcast. Uh, today we got David Riggs, uh, master agency owner here uh, on on the, to, to chat about sort of his experiences and and where he's coming from and sort of uh, Numa and and the future of Numa and everything that's going on there. Uh, and anything else we want to kind of rap about here, man? We can kind of get a little. Get a little wild, make some make some jokes, whatever whatever you feel, man. I, I like to make it uh, natural and just kind of flow. So, um, yeah, really happy to have you here, man. Yeah, thanks for the invite, man. Super excited to be here. And then always fair warning on podcasts. I got two dogs. Uh, they're going to try and jump into the podcast screen at some point. They're both uh, camera junkies. So if uh, if you oh, see a small Doberman mix or a Shepherd mix. A cute dog anytime, man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They were in uh, – I had a call with a client the other day. And one of them just decided he did, he wanted to take the call. And he was, you know, right here in the screen. And, you know, I was still talking like I was mid-presentation and nobody said a word until the very end of the call. And they were like, so by the way, like, what's your dog's name? And I was just like, you guys Oh, my right, God. Well. <laughs> well, that's always good, man. I mean, you can make a good impression that way, man. You know, people love dogs. So you, you got a little people secret weapon. Dogs. Maybe that's oh, how this I... secret is. Maybe that's scaling an agency. Get a cute dog and throw him in the camera, man. Get, get a cute dog, throw him in the camera, and, and you're good, man. That's the race to a million right there. <laughs> I love it. It's Warren Buffett's secret, too, I heard. Um, <laughs> this is awesome, man. Let's uh, let's dive in a little bit. I want to hear a little bit about your – kind of where you're coming from, you know, your, your journey so far, uh, you know, just – Kind of how you got to this point, uh, running Numa and and doing all the things you're doing, man. If you could just kind of wrap about that for a minute. Yeah, man. And actually, you'll you'll get the biggest benefit. Normally, I'm on these podcasts and I'll get like 30 minutes, and my story's long longer. And I was like, man, I can't fit this into 30 minutes, and then still talk about everything else. But we got some time here for her, which is good. So uh, I'll give you the full story. I think first time on a podcast in forever. Um, so we'll back it up. Uh, so even as I was younger, like, so I was born in Louisville, Kentucky, moved all around as a kid, was in Texas, was in Indianapolis, was in um, a cu- couple different spots. I honestly forget because we moved quite a bit. I was in three high schools in four years. Um, long story short, doing a lot of that. Uh, and I, I kind of followed my dad around in, in his job in multiple different cities and just got to meet cool people, got to see different cool things. Never really realized I was an entrepreneur until uh, truthfully college. So I went to a small liberal arts, all male college in the middle of Indiana. Um, one of the most interesting places to go to college. It's a great decision on my part. I know a lot of people talk about pros and cons and you don't need college and things like that. For me, one of the biggest things of college was that it taught me was I was an entrepreneur and helped me kind of form my vision of how I wanted to be an entrepreneur before I even really realized it. So, uh, the college I went to, right, really pushed internships. So my, and this is where it gets kind of at least fun or interesting sophomore year going to junior year, I interned at a money transfers firm and loved it. it you know, it was a small environment was doing a, just a lot of different special projects, really liked the guy who was running it, um, was a little over my head. Admittedly, it was just, I was too young to get it, but a lot of M and a financial analysis, Excel guy, right. That was where I kind of got hooked on that side of things. I mistook it for the fact that I actually liked finance. And what I really found out later is I just like business. Um, going into senior year, I actually interned at a Fortune 500 company, was a financial analyst, uh, made it about a week before I'm pretty sure the words like I, I will never do this again in my life came out. Uh, and funny enough, you know, I made it through the internship. They gave me two points of feedback in that internship that I worked too quickly and I wasn't as detail oriented as they needed. Uh, oddly enough, I've written those two things to a million dollar agency in under a year, uh, literally because that's just how you build businesses today. You, you can't be perfect and you can't take forever to do projects. And I always think back to that and think it's super funny, but I uh, ended up interning there, didn't love it. You know, was kind of scrambling for a job as I was graduating senior year, was looking at a job, was looking at, a, you know, keeping to run this agency, which I had had throughout college kind of as like a glorified freelancer. I was doing anything under the sun, man. I was doing email marketing, social media management, content creation, graphic design. Uh, If a client wanted to pay me for it, I'd figure out how to do it and do it at least well enough to to not get a refund hit. So um, all that to be said, you know, all these different ideas were going through my head uh, and landed a pretty cool job with a startup. Uh, It was in the software space, early stage. Um, I'm pretty sure I had, you know, some position or level of equity in the company, pretty decent salary. It was in the hometown. And I was like, this is a good this is a good starting point outside of college. So, uh, and mind you, this was 
two Octobers ago, two Novembers ago. Uh, so it was right before COVID hit March. So the whole time, you know, I had this job and then you start hearing about COVID and these companies start struggling. So I keep checking in with the guy who hired me and I was like, hey, you know, is my job still good? Like, are we going to push back the starting date? And he goes, you know, nothing to worry about, nothing to worry about, nothing to worry about. Uh, and nothing on them. I love those guys. But I got a call one morning that was like, hey, we can't take you on. Like, we're, we're laying off this many people. Like, your positions was one of those. We just can't take you on right now. And it was this big hit of like from October all the way to like March or April. And I thought I had a job locked in. And this was April of my senior year, a month before I was graduating. I went from having a job to not having a job. So I immediately was like, all right, we're just doing this agency thing. Um, doubled down, did the agency, hit a $10,000 a month pretty quickly. And I ironically got called up from another company wanting to offer me a $10,000 pay raise to come back and take the same offer that they had given me a year before that I actually turned down. New city, doing kind of like a, a consulting type role. I was like, you know what? This is actually pretty cool. Like this door just randomly opened. I love consulting, love things like that. Let's dive into it. So I actually did the agency in the background and took this job at the same time. So uh, starting in August of last year, so a little over a year ago, I started this company. Uh, it's a big healthcare company and I was doing like management consulting for them. And I had my agency at nighttime and even the morning. So like my daily schedule was like a six to 9 a.m. I was doing literally cold outreach and content creation for the agency, nine to five it, just doing my consulting stuff like that. And then from five to 10, I'd sit down and keep working on the agency, delivering you know projects, building systems, building processes, hiring people, things like that. And at some point or another, these two ships kind of passed in the night to where my nine to five was pay paying pretty well, especially for coming right out of college. But the agency started encroaching it and then it, you know, I was making as much and then two times as much or three times as much or four times as much. And I was just doing, you know, a little work here and there in the morning and at night, I had a team fulfilling a lot of this stuff. It was, it was running pretty smoothly. I was like, maybe this agency thing is for real that if I'm spending really, you know, four to five good hours a day on agency life and I'm able to double or triple what I'm making from a nine to five, which I don't enjoy, maybe it's time to kind of jump ship. So basically from like the second I graduated college to actually this January, I was, you know, in and out of jobs doing back and forth thing and kind of moonlighting the agency. And then this, I think January 27th or something like that is when I officially was done with my full nine to five job and have been running NUMA ever since. So uh, we really started picking up steam last September, NUMA Media did, um, and we are in about mid-October now, so about 13, 13 and a half months uh, since we really started going and had really good success, ramped a pretty awesome team, uh, and it's been a blast, man. But all that to be said, uh, and I always say this to other people looking at an agency or wanting to be an entrepreneur, you'll have no idea what your actual journey will look like until you know you get to the end because it, it'll take a hundred different paths in between there. Yeah, wow. very interesting program. It's, uh... It's awesome that you got, you know, I love being up, like, because it's kind of like coming from sort of a finance background and very official, you know what I mean? There, it's like, you know, you easily could like, you know, I don't know, work in hedge funds or work in, who knows, right? And you kind of took this weird fork in the road where you sort of, you know, took, took sort of this right turn, this left turn, whatever, out of nowhere and, and started kind of just going, you know, I could, I could probably make more money doing this. I could probably, I could probably have more fun doing this. I can, like my natural ability, it seemed like you had a natural knack for just speed over, uh, you know, planning out every tiny, you know, minuscule detail, which, you know, as we've seen, I think in financial markets, it also doesn't, uh, isn't, isn't really a huge advantage a lot of times also, you know, right? So it's, um, yeah, it's really, really, really cool. I love that, uh, that kind of like this into this. So, 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 so I guess my question is web design. Like what led you to web design specifically uh, out of sort of financial stuff? Like, I, and you said you love consulting, you know, all this kind of stuff, but I'm curious, sort of, Design is really interesting, and we'll dive into that a little bit later. But I'm curious, sort of, uh, where that came into play, and when, when did you kind of uh, get creative? Like, because you know, finan financial people are not known as generally the most uh, creative people as well. So yeah, so curious how that kind of worked out. Yeah, man, I, that's a great question. Um, and as you know, with financial markets and just financial analysis and things like that, there's a formula for everything, right? The right answer is what you can actually derive from something else or like there's a methodology to it. 
and I, you know, I f- was familiar with marketing, familiar with business. You know, I'd read, knew who Gary V was, like things like that, all the, the check boxes, right? Um, sure. But one thing that was never talked about, which I always thought was interesting, was web design. You know, Gary V talks a lot about content and social, but like every link that he has in his bio goes to his website. Same thing goes with all these other entrepreneurs, mm-hmm. right? And like every one of these companies had a website, not a single marketing company actually talked about websites. So for a while, I was just like, ah, oh, they just think, you know, social is more important or content more important. That's fine. And then I got into it and I was like, you know, I really don't think anybody actually understands websites. Like, I don't think they get their purpose. Yeah. I don't think they understand how to build them, what to build them with, what design should look like. Like, no one's really tapped into that in a way that they've made it e- easy to understand. But also web mm. design had been going through this process in the past 10 years of like, it was all code. Now it's a lot of no code. But a lot of people mm-hmm. don't know about no code. They just think they still got to pay a firm 40K to go do some HTML, CSS and build a site that breaks every week, right. right? So I got right. into it and I was really looking at like, this is, I think, something that not a lot of people talk about that, I mean, it's beneficial to me. Like I, I'm looking through it and I'm like, man, I use a website every day. I'm buying stuff off of websites. I'm using websites to vet people. But when I was considering colleges, I didn't go to their social pages. I went to their website to read. Like. It's one of those things that like, I think people forget to, like they romanticize everything else. Websites are just that, you know, the, the tried and true marketing method in the corner that everyone forgets about. So, and you'll hear this a lot in the podcast and this is just how I, I go. I was talking with a friend the other day about NFTs and crypto and things like that. And, and while super interesting, and I'll probably get in that space, that whole wave could pass me by, right? Because ultimately right. what I, I'm most interested in is what are the fundamentals of business? Why do people spend money with you and how can you make them not in a bad way, spend even more money with you over time. How can you retain them? How can you build a good experience? That stuff all plays into it, but that's the base of everything. And long story short, you know, financial markets, the web design, finance just has a very rhythmic system to it, but it is a system nonetheless. Things go in certain spots, but people, you know, if they're good at it, can tell a story of financial data. Um, Mm -hmm. And the other thing I was always looking at, and I remembered almost getting into marketing, one of the first internships I had, uh, the founder or owner was looking at buying uh, another company. And he was like, hey, we're just going to slash marketing advertising. And I was like, why? And he was like, you know, it never produces results. It's just an, ex- like, it's just an expense. And honestly, for him, it, it might have been right because I'm looking back at it now. And I was like, that was some pretty poor marketing. Um, but I was like, man, if that's how people think about it, then we need to flip marketing on its head. It doesn't have to be always tied to some type of revenue number, but we should point back and say, hey, over the course of a year, if we look back, I spent $10 of marketing and made 80 like we should be able to break that down. And long story short, I'm yeah. bringing that financial side into it. It brings me into a spot to where the marketing that we have to do has to have a purpose and have to have a reason. Um, there's something called a 10K that you file every year as a public company, right? 10Ks, those numbers are there for a reason. You just don't haphazardly put numbers on a 10K. They have to tell that story, right? Same thing with the website. You know, a lot of people are just like, they used to haphazardly throw stuff on a website, check the box and tell their investor or VC fund that, hey, we got a website up. You know, here's the domain and nobody spell checks it. No one looks at the stock photos. It's just up there and it's always a disadvantage to me. And that's why I've always said, you know, the website agency space, but especially web design needs somebody more than a freelancer, right? But it needs somebody that can understand the whole ecosystem of what a website does outside of just funnels or just blogs or just case studies. A website's power is all that stuff put together. Um, And really, you know, whether it's financial background or just seeing some of that other stuff come together, I think this is where I'll end it, right? Financial markets are huge. There is a yeah. lot of intertwined parts. One thing happens over here, something new happens over there. All that to be said, it all comes back down to, you know, one thing in the company, which is more or less PL, how they run themselves, how they position themselves. Like, what is that company's brand, the metrics behind that brand, and how are they presenting themselves to the public? Same thing goes with the website, right? You can have all this, you know, social media ad, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn all comes back to your website, how you present yourself, what your values, propositions are, and like what other content you have. Because last time I checked, you know, nobody's buying a Salesforce product over at Instagram DM with Salesforce. They may get awareness there, but they're coming to a, they're coming to a website and converting it. And that's where the, the gold is to be had, so to speak. So long story short, that, that's both my rant, but coming from somebody that really didn't grow up as like a graphic designer or a web designer, or even you know, I never took a marketing class in college. It was just kind of self-taught based on the backs of like, how do people actually buy today versus what was written in that, you know, marketing textbook from 92 that tells people to gain all the content so you can follow up on email. Man, it's, it's really, it's really, ep- I, it's so funny that you bring it that way. You're definitely putting an interesting context on 
web design because in general you know or, or websites rather i should say not web design but websites you know that that you know there there's a system behind it it's not just a you know people think of a website as and you know, like you said you know just hey we got the website up check you know check you know uh done you know kind of thing and and that it's so much more than that it's where conversions happen essentially it's where it's where the actual action gets taken i guess so that yeah no that's really and it's an ecosystem like you're saying i really i appreciate i appreciate the way you're bringing this i'm gonna have some very strange questions or interesting questions here we can dive into because i think yeah this is i mean I love it, man. it's the way i've always felt that's the way i've always felt too man honestly about this you know it's it's like people write off the website and and people kind of are it's it's this war between like sales funnels or you know the traditional yeah. website model or the this or the that and at the end of the day, it's like, yeah. And also, I love the way that you're taking kind of a financial analyst perspective on it and, and looking back 12 months and going, okay, was the ROI over the last 12 months of all these little micro actions and, and sort of, you know, tunnels that we built through this system, right? And, and how does that actually look on, on a big map, like on a wall, like, you know, zoomed out looking at that instead of these kind of... Uh, you know, and I know you'll agree that, you know, CEOs are generally, uh, you know, looking for ROI very quickly on whatever actions they're taking. And it's just such a stupid thing because it's like, yeah, no, like in the modern. So so anyway, I'll, let's um, let me kind of jump in there. I'm sagging right into a couple of different things. So two two things pop into my mind immediately, which is number one is the dark funnel. Uh, what 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 a lot of people like to call the dark funnel yeah. or, or whatever you want to call that. The, the mystery funnel. I don't know. You know, I don't know what the what the term is. I love the dark funnel because it's just that's mm -hmm. kind of what it feels like when you go through like you're driving, you know, long distance and you go through that tunnel and you lose all reception and you know you, your cell phone dies and you lose everything and you're just in this damn tunnel and you're like, man, I hope this thing doesn't fall <laughs> in on me, right? And I think so. You got the dark funnel. That's that's one side of what I want to ask you about. And then kind of in conjunction with the dark funnel, we also have and for everybody listening, the dark funnel is basically that area where you can't track anything. You've got people looking at, like you said, looking at Instagram for brand awareness, you know, seeing a billboard, uh, you know, clicking on the website, leaving the website, bookmarking the website, though, then coming back to the website two weeks later, uh, maybe outside of the uh, Google Analytics conversion window or whatever you're using, right? And then, you know, so it's just these, these little touches that you can't track that are not being attributed to the overall ROI or the, or the customer journey of, of that. And when you're, uh, and, and you talk about this on Twitter, which I love is going too data focused, you end up losing that, that okay. side of things, right? And, and, and a lot of that is like psychology and all these other things, which we'll get into. And then we also have the modern B2B and, and, and B2C for that matter, kind of buyer's journey, which is changing radically over the, I think over the last year, it's completely like, it's completely flipped on its head. And I don't, I don't know if you agree, but People now are like getting references from from you know communities. People are getting references from friends. People want people want this kind of they want to do their research. They want to explore the thing. They want to educate themselves, and then they want to make a buying decision on their own terms. And that's changing the way that we're like attributing things, the way that ROI even looks, I guess, and the whole. But like you said, it all comes back to the website. So I'm curious what you think about that buyer journey. I'm curious what you think about the dark funnel. I'm curious, kind of your standpoint kind of on on what is trackable how, how how does that roi look now how is that being attributed uh do you believe that there's like a really concrete way to attribute all of that stuff to revenue or do you think that you know I, i'm very curious like just on your kind of your open thoughts on this because it's big man it's big right now it is big and this is one of the things all those founders and owners right they, they want to track everything. They want ROI in a week. And the, the thing I always say here is increase your time horizons and you'll actually find some like reasonable success. People overestimate what they can do in 15 years, underestimate what they can do in 10 days. Find that happy medium, yep. right? Like your ad campaign is not going to generate a million dollars in revenue in, in two weeks. Sorry. Like it's, it's not unless you spend $10 million and you do it poorly, you might make a million dollars. Um, but, but the other part here, which I think is interesting, especially as you talk about dark social, there's a guy I follow on LinkedIn, Chris Walker, and I don't know if he coined it or not, but Chris talks about this in yeah. such a, a great way. And it's definitely something I agree with because it's how we pitch the websites. You know, hey, you know, we'll get a typical prospect come through. How can we track conversions or like how can you point that this person came through SEO and, you know, they, they converted on this blog and I can prove that SEO works. It's like uh, almost why is that important for you to know? I have not had a single prospect give me give me a good answer other than the fact that 
I need to report up to my boss, which makes perfect sense. Or it's almost like a comfort thing, right? Like I have to have data to rely on here. And then it's yeah. almost asking the question of like, hey, if you're a smart, good founder and you have very good understanding of your ICP, why don't you just ask them how they found you? Is that not more important than tracking it on some software? And that normally gets them to think differently. I will, I've probably lost deals, to be honest, because I, you know, I'm sticking my stake in the ground there. But you know, I'm not going to overemphasize to set up 37 different things on your website to track a conversion. Whenever ideally, I could hear a website on social time and time and time and time and time and time, and time again. Maybe forget the name, but remember, you know, the the industry that the software is called. Plug it into Google. Find the website name because I see it and remember it. Well, what attribution software says is, hey, he came through SEO. Go pay your SEO team more. What actually happened is that good content won me. I use Google to search for traffic because I trust Google and it's the easiest thing. And I have Chrome downloads it on my phone instead of Safari. And it's super simple to click. Game over. Right? That's right. People forget that, but it doesn't fit how people have been reported to either. And you have to remember, in like the financial world where I used to work in a Fortune 500, everyone had reports that went up, went up, went up, went up, went up. Even if the model had changed drastically in the market, those reports still happened because that top guy was used to getting it from the second guy who was used to getting it from the third guy. Nobody wanted to break that chain. Right. We, we were just doing stuff to do it. And that's where I think the one thing – and I'll, I'll even say it, attribution software is not a bad thing. It's going to give you a great idea about where people are on your site. You know, something like a hot jar or an Oribe or something like that are great tools. Take it with a grain of salt. That great tool is going to be wrong more than you actually care to admit. I, I actually probably yeah. overemphasize on the wrong way. I don't install that stuff on our website. I, I really could care less because I have a kickoff call with every single one of our clients. In a discovery call, I ask them how they found us and what made them actually book in a call. You know, why did you show up on this call today? And then we have an offboarding call as well that I ask them more in depth about their buying journey. All of that stuff gets pieced, pieced together. That's what informs my marketing strategy. Um, you know, all, all the conversions, attributions are cool. It gives me some good insight, but does it really, you know, change the game for you? Especially if you're a founder that understands the marketing and dark social, I'd be spending more time talking to customers, getting better ideas about my product, but also getting better ideas about how they actually buy products today than just what, you know, a Google Analytics dashboard is going to tell me or Rebe is going to tell me or, you know, Hotjar tells me and things like that. So uh, it's definitely happening. And I, I really think I'm a terrible example. I, I put my phone in another room while I work. We we'll use my little magnet wallet as my phone. But people have their phones on them every single day. And yeah. it is incredible that people have yet to understand, especially companies, that I'm going to sit here at my desk and my phone was here and I'm going to scroll social. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Snapchat, things like that, TikTok. I'm going to get brand awareness there. And this might be me. This might be others. I, I don't know. But let's see. I find a really cool uh, sweatshirt that I love. It's a dope brand. And I'm actually thinking of one called Italic right now on Twitter. I pull up their website on my phone. I click the share button. I text it to myself. Then I pull it up on my desktop and actually keep scrolling. No attribution software is going to catch that. And that's how no, people really do no. I mean, if you pull up your own message thread or... Twitter thread or something, you just send yourself stuff to go read later. And you normally yep. do read it. You pull it up on a desktop. You don't pull it back up on your phone. 100%, man. 100%. Now, this is in, and I love Chris Walker, by the way. Uh, big shout out to him, man. What a, what a, uh, yeah, what a smart what a, dude. What a so, dude. yeah, no. He is yeah, what smart a, what a and guy. knows his stuff, too. <laughs> yeah, what a, what a, what a guy, indeed. Uh, and, and so, yeah, no, what, what you're saying, I mean, I love, I love what you're saying because, yeah, the, the habits of people, especially cross device, all this stuff, I mean, it's, yeah, it's just it's nearly impossible to attribute every single sale to some place. But what you're bringing to the table, and this is something that's becoming kind of a consistent thing on this podcast. Apparently, I don't I don't know how this is happening. I knew I knew this would happen, but trends are are definitely coming to the light uh, constantly. And I think this is one of them. Um, you're building relationships with your clients, and you're talking with them, and you're asking them key questions uh, so that you can get an idea of where they came from, what the journey looked like, uh, why they're leaving. You know, all all these different elements and why they're signing on, why they're leaving, what what attracted them about your service and your particular ethos on this stuff. And and in, in indeed the, the buyer's journey also. Like where did you find us? How can you kind of walk me through a little bit of how you, you got in touch with me? And you know, yeah, like I, I totally know. I've done the same thing in the past. And it's like you're always surprised at how the hell they found you. You're like, what? Like, whoa, okay, that's kind of yeah. 
interesting. Okay, so you saw my thing on Twitter, then you like, you know, or, or you saw some SEO, something on Google, and then you researched it further, and then you checked it out, and then you like asked somebody, your, your buddy who, you know, knows a lot about web design, you think, or whatever, uh, to check out the site and kind of vet you for him. And then you, he was on the golf course and checking out. It's, it's like the weirdest thing, I guess, you know, how these kind of journeys actually look. And um, I think old HubSpot model, you know, and I talk about this a lot where like the old HubSpot model of kind of, you know, uh, 2010 era, you know, digital marketing where it's, you know, throw a webinar, um, you know, get email addresses. Those are leads. All right. Now take those leads and have a sales rep. Exactly. Lead, you know, they're MQLs, whatever the hell that means. Right. And then, you know, in, in, in this weird chasm of whatever the fuck this is and then they're jumping on a call and these sales reps are just pounding them they're just pounding them pounding them pounding them hey man you're on the webinar would you like to buy and they and you know people you know it, it, i think before people were kind of like oh yeah right, I'm check it out and maybe i want to buy it you know but then but, but more and more as we go forward that model's just dying and people yeah. that jump on a webinar are not a lead they are they are just someone trying to get some educational content and right and they're just that's just one step in that buyer if you're giving them, it's, because it's about becoming that trusted advisor and building relationships more than anything. And I think as we go forward into marketing, it seems like being more genuine, um, giving more education and context and all this kind of thing for what you're offering uh, and, and, and letting them explore that thing as kind of, they, like giving them every asset you can possibly give them is becoming more important than actually mapping out a funnel where you're driving them down different paths and all this kind of, you know, marketing automation speak and, and all this kind of stuff. So. And it always, I, I'm, I'm simplicity all the way through. Right. So like I do not overcomplicate anything. And some of these people will show their funnels or like their marketing automation stack. I'm just like, yeah. man, what'd that take you like 20 hours? They're like, yeah, you know, it took <laughs> can me. Can you even read something. that? I'm like, how many customers, can you even read that? But how many customers did you talk to in that four weeks? Oh, I had none. I actually yep. don't have any yet. I've just been building this first. Why? It's just like we've lost this fact that like marketing really comes down to understanding your customers and creating content. Oh, oh used to be creating content is interesting. I'm almost shifting creating content that they're going to share to their best friend. Right. Yeah. What can you create yep. that somebody's going to pull off your website and send it to a friend? And I've heard this. I think it's from Chris Walker. What content can you create that's going to be shared in the Slack community? That That's your North Star now, right? You can't track conversions on yep. that. And yeah, it's almost, Chris doesn't say this, I say this. Why do we even care to track conversions? Like, let's just create good content. If it's going to yeah. take me another, an hour a day to track conversions, I'd rather use that hour to create another piece of content. Um, I, I think that's what it comes down to, it kind of flipping on its head. But yeah, man, like we'll run into some of these companies that are like your 07 HubSpot nerds that want to run gated webinars. And it's like, you know, that's great, but like, let's look at, all of that at the end, like you guys are chasing and, and you put the North Star at top of funnel leads that that's the metric that's going to play the numbers game. You forget that the other equation here is actually just increasing quality. You know, we track yeah. booked appointments. Um, our revenue has about 10, 10 to 15% increased every single quarter. And I think one, it was like 45, 30, I think it was like 20 last quarter. So even a little bit higher to be truthful. Um, our booked meetings has stayed stagnant exactly mm. how I want it to be. Mm. I'm not mm. wasting our sales team's time. I'm not wasting my time. We are wow. staying right at stagnant. We're just attracting the right people that are coming in. Wow. And we went wow. from Let's like find... 120K. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, I was going to say, go we went from 120K one quarter. I think our first quarter was like 120, 130K. I think we did 247, 249 last quarter. Um, mm -hmm. That's growing quick, right? I Literally, and I, I'll pull it up. I think last month, and you'll be... This is just where I'm, I am a data person. 22 meetings last month. Our highest ever meetings booked month was 28. Yeah, yeah, no. So let, let's zoom in on that for a sec because I really love that, that, that you know, it's uh, everybody thinks, I, you know, I think there's a very common conception that, you know, more book meetings equals more sales, and, but also they're not looking at the quality of the clients. They're not looking right because what you're doing is understanding your audience. And I wanted to dive in with this. Uh, I'll niche stuff in a second, but I think as far as, you know, knowing your customer also is becoming a theme on this podcast that, you know, you're, you're zooming in and knowing your ICP your ideal client profile, like more and more and more as you're going and less meetings are actually 
going to a higher closing rate. So you're, what are the metrics you're tracking there that kind of um, push you forward, I guess? Is it, it, you know, I always try to focus, I guess my, my ethos is always revenue and fun. Really, it just comes down to sales, like re actual bottom line revenue and fun that you're having in the process. So do you like the niche? Do you like the clients? Do you like working with them? But I'm curious kind of what your proxies look like on that. Yeah, well, I think on the ICP front, I tweeted about this the other day, but your ICP yeah. is not something that you just throw down on a piece of paper and send to your founder and say, hey, here's our target audience, dude. Like, let's go crush a marketing and sales campaign. <laughs> No, that's not how that's not yeah. how it goes. Like what it actually looks like is you getting in the market and fulfilling for every single service that you can figure out and then ramp mm -hmm. that from one million to ten million. And there's a guy I follow on Twitter, extremely smart marketer, works at a company that I respect highly. He was like, Hey, you know, zero to one million ARR is way different than one to ten, which is way different from the ten to fifty. It was like, Hey, yeah. you know, what was your focus ten ten to fifty, right? Or like one to ten, I think is what I asked him. And it was product market fit. Zero to one wasn't yeah. product market fit. Maybe for them, you know, I'm sure they did research. Zero to one is literally, can you stay alive? Can you get revenue, which is your oxygen, yeah. to breathe another day? One to 10 is like, all right, cool. We worked with 37 different industries. I hated 33 of them. These four are okay. Let's niche onto this one and then ramp it for the other three later on. Um, so yeah, I think ICP is something that people really misunderstand. It's not something that you get from a Seth Godin book either. If you really read what Seth Godin talks about, he's like, hey, know your audience, but you can't take a guess. Like you can't draw it out of a hat and be like, Oh, real estate. All right, let's do it. Like you, you got to go yeah. learn who you actually work well with. Um, but the other thing about metrics that I track, right. So I, I have our, uh, we, we custom build everything in Airtable, So I got a full suite over here, but no, right. We're looking at new accounts booked in every month. We're looking at pipeline added on those months in light of those accounts. So, you know, in uh, September, right, we had 22 meetings, but we had 242,000 in pipeline value. So like contractually, that's what, those new accounts are going to be worth. We'll look at the right. basics, right? What did we actually close that month on a billing perspective or an account perspective? So hopefully always going up and to the right. The one that's interesting though, right? So you think about revenue and you think, let's say I closed in uh, easy, easy math. You know, let's say you, you close a $5,000 deal you collect all 5,000 up front. So you made $5,000 in October. A lot of people say, man, October is a great month. I just made 5K. I actually care more about now, when did that lead enter our CRM? Let's look at mm -hmm. revenue based on entry date, not on close date, right? So if I close that lead in October, it looks like on paper to a report, if it's rev by close date, I made 5K in October. Whatever we were doing in October must have been working. That's actually the wrong way to look about it because that lead yep. actually came into your CRM in April. Whatever I was doing in April actually worked. So yeah, what man. we look at is yes. like our best month by revenue by close date uh, September, our best month revenue by entry date was uh, August. And I will always look at like, what were we doing in August? Not what were we were doing in September, because in September we were closing. August, we were marketing, right? So I want to know what we were doing in marketing to lead that eventual revenue metric forward. Um, that's the one that I'm really starting to dive into heavily. And again, I'm pretty sure it's a Chris Walker like drop. I think it was on one of his webinars or like his demand in live or whatever. But yeah. Switching your mindset to see revenue close by entry date into your CRM. I challenge a lot of you guys just to go do that and play around with it today because I did it and was like, well, this is like super interesting data in the sense of like one of the months that I thought we crushed actually is one of our worst months in terms of revenue by entry date because we were so busy closing. I didn't do any marketing and that screwed us the following month because I had no pipe. Brilliant, man. Now that's a, that's a brilliant insight. So yeah, for every everyone listening, that is that's huge, and that's actually. I mean, I'm I'm blown away by that because yeah, I hadn't I had not heard uh, that spoken in such simplistic terms. I, I love how you're simplifying it, you know, because it's it's 100 percent true. Like you know those those content pieces that you put out and distributed or you know tweeted about or what you know on the sim you made some stuff and shot it out there in the world, posted a couple YouTube videos. And then around this time you started closing the deals. Now that that's absolutely enormous. And I think, yeah, like that's a great challenge for, for everyone listening. Uh, as David said, you know, check, check the entry dates on your CRM and boy, if you're not tracking that kind of stuff and you're not like keeping, keeping tabs on that stuff, man, start doing it immediately, immediately. You know, those are the, those are the kinds of things you can track, right? Is when, when did someone come in, book a meeting with you, the, the initial, that initial moment, a real lead, someone that really reached out to a sales, you know, in, in a sales capacity, right? 
and not just a webinar sign up, somebody who uh, commented on your Twitter post, I, I don't know, whatever other weird uh, metrics that, you know, other people are calling a lead, you know what I mean? So that that's yeah. really huge. And I love, and I, yeah, I so and I love, the, uh, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, if we want to dive into CRM, because I think this is an interesting topic in general, Right, sure. CRMs get overcomplicated. You can go buy like the thirty thousand dollar build out from Salesforce or whatever. And I, to be honest, some companies do need that. Straight up, some companies are going to need something that specified because they're running ten billion dollar firms. I'm not running a ten billion dollar firm. I don't need Salesforce. I'm happy with my custom Airtable because it works. But you know, our Airtable's gone yeah. back and forth about like what do we track, what do we not track. Uh, there's a couple things I'd say. So I'm looking at like our statuses. We have one status called Icebox. That is something to where if somebody comments on my Twitter post and I think they're dope, I throw them in the ice box just to keep an eye on them because I, I want to be there. But, you know, webinar leads and things like that, we don't gate anything. But even if we did, you know, the only people that are hitting the CRM are people that want to talk to me, which means people that booked in a call. If you only filled out a webinar and stuff like that, you don't see the light of day in my, my CRM. You never enter my CRM. That's why we only have 306 records. We're far more people than that have shown interest in things like that. We only want to talk to you and show interest in you if you want to sh talk to us and show interest in us, right? Like, I'm not going to chase right. dead leads around. But the other thing I'd say as well is like, I've seen CRMs that have, you know, some crazy stats. Like, why are you tracking that? It's not worth, it's not worthwhile anything. We right. always track, you know, what stage are they in? What's the status? What service do they want? Who's the contact lead? We track the company name, the account. So the guy or gal, whoever, whoever is like our point of contact, we track their estimated value and then just, Three things, their entry date into the CRM, their estimated close date, their actual closed one date or closed loss date so I can track a sales cycle. And then two other things, their win loss reason, why we think they chose to go with us if we normally ask and their point of attribution. Right. So two wildly different things, right? They could get us from Facebook outbound and close with us because they saw my cute dog on camera and loved us. Or they could come inbound LinkedIn and close with us because they really like our podcast videos and we presented ourselves in the right light. So. Tracking those two things as well in terms of where they're attributing and why they're attributing is just as important as, you know, even tracking that data to begin with. You, you want to make sure you have both of those things there. Well, I love, I love the, I love the way you're kind of tracking impact. It, you're, you're, it's sort of like a way, it's sort of proxies to, to, to sort of track the impact that, that you're having. Like what had the impact on them? Was it the podcast? education was it the uh dm with the with the doggy you know it's like it, it those two things have a very different um sort of impact on, on on the person right like that that's a different channel altogether and a different style of content a different like a sales call if they went direct to a sales call and you did a great presentation on a sales call it's a lot different than them sort of watching all of your podcast videos and then jumping into the funnel right so it's like yeah i love i love how there's there's sort of a proxy for I don't know. I don't know if it's impact or if it's um, you know, uh, you know, interest focus or what what that is. But it's it's really powerful. Yeah, and I was just it always comes back. There's a book I read, read, and honestly probably need to reread now that I I misspoke that. But uh, four disciplines of execution. So it talks about the lead goal and the lag goal. Um, the book is gold. If you're listening to this, go buy it. If you don't want to spend whatever it is like eighteen dollars, DM me and I'll, I will literally buy it for you. I buy that book for endless amounts of people. Um, the main thing though, is it talks lead goal and lag goal, right? A lot of people, and this is why they set new year's resolutions and they never hit it. They set a lag goal. I want to lose 10 pounds this year. Great. That's not a goal because like when you step on that scale at the end of the year, you're done. That's your one point of feedback, your one point of emphasis, you're out. You either hit it or you did it. But you know, what happens if we track in the lead goal? What actions can I take to actually fulfill this lag goal later on? I'm going to work out four times a week. That's trackable. You get more instantaneous feedback. And you can pivot as the year goes on to see maybe I need five workouts or three workouts, right? So I track a lot of that lead metric to the lag metric down the line. You have to figure out how to make revenue first, and then you can start backtracking to the point now to where, you know, revenue depends on demo calls or proposals sent out, right? Proposals depend on demos. Demos depend on discovery calls. Discovery calls depend on podcast episodes and LinkedIn posts. So we've backtracked it to where now we just know that I need to wake up and produce a ton of content because everything else is taken care of. So that's something I'd recommend as well. But the one thing I'd say, man, I hear a lot of people say like, oh, you know, 50% of our leads come from Facebook. It's crushing for us right now. No, it's not. That just means 50% of your ICP spends too much time on Facebook. And that's the easiest way to get in touch with you. What you really need to look at is why people are actually clicking a button and, and booking in a call. I don't care right. if they come through Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn, right? That's right. just the, the platform that my ICP is using. 
what matters is the content that's actually getting them to come to your funnel and sign up. Absolutely, and the, and the reasons and, and the, the sort of the reasons why they're even reaching out in the first place, I guess, right? And why they're even ingesting yeah. that. It's the content that, that's the focus. It's the, yeah, well, if it's an ad, what is in that ad? What is in that call to action? What, what is that image composed of? And yeah, and again, I think it goes back to what you said. It's building relationships. It's talking to your clients or your prospects and actually asking them key questions like this. Because I think a lot of people don't, they just don't ask, you know? They, they just kind of, like you said, they go too hard on the data and they just don't understand. They're not actually getting real data from people, from people's mouths. You know what I mean? Because it's just so different, right? Even like a survey, like you get someone to fill out a survey and you're going to get such different answers than if you get them on a phone call. And, you know, it's like I could have emailed back and forth with you and asked you, hey, what about the deep funnel and the B2B buyer's journey? And you would have been like, oh, yeah, da 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 right? And it's like, no, in, the, in, in, in this format, we're going to speak so much deeper about it. We're going to kind of go into. So, yeah, those those kind of like meandering conversations can actually bring out, I think, a lot of the value. And um, it's just more, I think for everyone listening, it's just more uh, motivation to speak to people, to, t to not be, don't be afraid of speaking with people and, and getting real insight on what's working and what's not, right, from the actual people's mouths. So um, I think that's huge. Uh -huh. One thing I wanted to ask you about real, real quick, I wanted to ask you a real, de uh, a real specific question about one of your tweets that I really enjoy. Yeah, I think this is also becoming kind of a theme of the podcast, I would say, and, I, and I'm really enjoying it because I think it's something that's really uh, under, it's not talked about enough. It's sim similar to the website situation you were talking about, uh, that being a system, that having mechanics of its own and all this kind of stuff in the marketing context and, 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 and ecosystem. Um, you had mentioned something about uh, 300 Gs of uh, revenue coming through strategic partnerships uh, in 2021. And this is something that's just kind of naturally come up with almost every guest I've talked about, just with you know partnerships and the power of partnerships. I'm like a huge fan of uh, Jay Abraham, and I've like you know reading, uh, uh, getting all you can out of, uh, of, of everything you got, kind of like sort of shattered my world at some point where I was like, whoa, you know, it, it, there's so much talk about like you're saying, there's so much talk about attribute metrics and this and that and you know CRMs and building marketing automation flows that are like look insane, right? This all this crap is like so pervasive and talked about um and no one's talking about what jay is talking about where it's like hey man like build a strategic partnership network get referrals in from other pl places you know rent prospect lists from other companies who are complimentary you know find like find your audience in in weird places also don't just go after these like main channels so i'm really curious to kind of hear your thoughts on strategic partnerships and you would kind of privately mention to me that you know or, or publicly on twitter rather i asked you and you would kind of mention you know you had more of a program around that than i think a lot of other people uh frankly have so i'm really curious sort of what that looks like and um, just to kind of give, you know, everybody listening a little bit of insight into sort of strategic partnerships and a uh, right way to handle that. Yeah, man, strategic partnerships are one of those things that I, I find this in a lot of things. The, the boring solution or the easy solution is overlooked because people think success has to be hard. And this is like talking to your customers, right? How hard is it to pick up your phone? dial your customer's number and ask him three questions. It's the easiest thing you can do. You can walk while you go get your $7 Starbucks in the morning like I did, right? Uh, even that off topic, I do the little Panera coffee subscription. I don't know if you got a Panera behind or near you or anywhere, but it's like $9 a month. You get a free cup of coffee every day. It's unreal. Yeah, goddamn. But yeah. I was going to say, so while I'm walking to get my free cup of coffee every morning, it's super easy for me to text the customer. I literally, I got clients that I will text daily. Well, what's going on in your world? Give me some industry news. Give me some updates, right? That's where if anybody thinks anything for this podcast, success doesn't always have to be hard. And if you think it is, there's probably some other mental model that you got coming back from high school or college the same way I did, the same thing I've had to work through. It's not a bad thing. It's not a good thing. It's just something you'll have to get over. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I do really think, right, as you talk about it, let's do the easy thing. Let's actually just figure it out and, and do the straightforward answer. And for us, that was partnerships, right? And it came back to this musing of why on earth am I reinventing the wheel and building my own list when almost everyone in the B2B space has either bought something or sold something. So there's this master list out there that you can kind of pull parts from that will give me exactly who I need that's already purchased, that has good purchasing history, that has good revenue, that has good numbers, that has decision makers that are cool, right? Why not? So. We're doing a lot of partnerships now. And initially it, it did really start as this. It was a, you know, hey Alex, you send me a client, I'm gonna shoot you some cash back. 
done finders feet Mm -hmm. that's super boring it works nonetheless if that's where you're at now awesome works but now i started to think about okay cool what could i do differently what can i do to really get people excited to think truthfully create our truest fans but treat that partnership program more important than our actual sales funnel how can i get the coolest people in our partner program right so i started thinking at it more and i was like okay cool let's actually offer these people discounted services for us so if you're a partner program and you just sign a dotted line, it's free of charge, you could start today, you, you automatically get a 5% discount with Numa forever. And that 5% discount doesn't have a limit. You know, it could be a $100,000 project or a $2 project. You're getting a 5% discount, which is also good for you. There's no cap. There's no weird thing or clause in there. You get 5%. And it's really enticing for a lot of people that are like, man, seriously? And I had this happen yesterday, to be honest. A partner guy came in, referred a site to us. Closed. I'm like, hey, by, man, you know, by the way, you get 5% off of any project. Cool. Sign me up for SEO. Done. Over, over and out. It's as easy as that, right? Um, and I think that's one thing. That was our second stage. So we, we give you cash. We also save you cash. So if you do it right, you might actually save or, or make 10% of value on, and on everything that you do because you're saving 5% and getting 5%. Um, and, and then the other part, which I think is more interesting, if you talk about you know, okay, what do other people value? Well, they value knowledge, they value community, and they value simplicity and ease. So as we were talking about earlier, we brought up NUMA talent, we brought up, um, and we didn't bring it up, but you know, trainings and courses and, you know, agency systems, business systems, all that stuff down the line is ultimately going to be in like a closed, closed, you just have to message us to be part of the the program and you'll sign up, Uh, a closed page on our site. The goal of it is to have, you know, a job board kind of stuck in this closed community. It's going to have, I say courses, vaguely speaking, but like our LMS and SOP clients could do trainings and things like that. So if we have a real estate agent and a Facebook ads person and a videographer and a photographer, all those people can use that area to kind of market themselves, but also just create a community. That way everybody can kind of log in and log out and meet people. There'll be a directory that says, Hey, you know, I'm a SaaS person, but I need a real estate agent in Denver. Cool. Go check out the partner program. We actually have one in Denver that you can go hit up and his contact info will be right there for you. Right. So try to build this community, but make it really, really cool for people to be part of a new partner program. We're going to treat it as a loss leader. Um, A lot of time, energy and money is going to be put into developing something like that. It'll be a massive win for us because it's just brand equity, brand awareness. I get a whole other side of business where I get to talk to people and network soon as they hear somebody that needs a website you know how quick they're going to refer us if i've helped them hire somebody and find a real estate agent in a new city and told them about how to do trainings and sops and given them trainings on seo right and connected them to a new business partner they put together a a ten thousand dollar deal we're going to be their guys for websites and the best part is we actually do good work so it's a win-win for them as well Uh, and and that's really where ultimately it's going to head i'm super excited to see where it goes but yeah that's where finders fees are cool that's not a partner program. You're just hiring a, an ad hoc sales team. Partner program is all about how can you build a community out of it that actually helps you still generate some awareness and revenue. I think that's that's brilliant, man. I mean, a community, I think also is one of these things, you know, as we speak about the modern B2B journey, as we speak about the dark funnel, as we speak about all these things, it's like, you know, community is kind of where it all comes back to in some, in some sense, you know, that uh, people want to be referred in by other people that they trust more than anything. Now it's, it's really come down to that. And I've, I've seen Facebook groups in the past, you know, kind of become that, um, you know, what one leg of that. And a lot of people, you know, find like a lot of business on Facebook groups just by being referred in, you know, Twitter's being like that at, at this point too. I'm seeing that kind of evolve. So it's like just that, that the community element of that. I love that you're bringing it all sort of in, uh, into your, website and your scheme though you know and you have it like as sort of almost like a membership you know it's it's a bit exclusive there's some exclusivity there um and and all that kind of thing so it's really inspiring i think for anyone listening this is this should be super inspiring to you like that um you know start building community earlier than later like get get into this kind of mindset earlier than later um like i said it, I, my, my recommendation is to study you know jay abraham's sort of like methodology on a lot of this stuff because he he, he, co- he goes into F- Fortune 100 companies and he just tells them like, hey, man, you need to build more partnerships. Here you go. Here's a list of people. You know, it's like he, he, he doesn't do much, you know, but the things he did. And it, again, I think it comes down to impact, which is another element of what you were talking about before. I think what you're measuring in your CRM to me is, is sort of a proxy where you're measuring like the impact that that they got from you that led them 
to reaching out to you, right? And this is like another thing that's creating a huge impact. It's simple, it's easy. There's no complexity to it really at all. You know, this can be done with tech and, and with a whole uh, system in the website and all this kind of stuff, memberships and stuff, or this can be done just just through, you know, uh, manual work, you know what I mean? Really easily if you're like early stage and doing this, but the impact of these little movements that, that are gonna have over the long term are just enormous. And so I feel like that's something that you're kind of, zooming into and you're kind of uh, educating everyone on right now is just these these little levers, I guess you could call it, like like these little pieces of leverage, right, that you have, um, that you're creating and you're doing it through content, you're doing it through um, tracking uh, the right kinds of metrics and not just all these like other things that people are telling you to, uh, to do, you do it through strategic partnerships and, and a partnership program that's um, ballooning out in all kinds of different sort of arms of this thing. Um, yeah, and I just love it, man. I love how you're coming simplicity and it's always kind of always sort of rotating back to uh simplicity um and yeah, so man. that's that's wonderful i think everyone should take that away from this and i think one last thing i really want to ask you about um <laughs> i'm looking at my notes and it's so funny i just i wrote down this note where you're saying something that marketers need to think more like psychologists and less like data analysts and i think that's so funny coming from a financial data analyst background i, I just love that i, I can't I, I just had to mention that that's just it, it goes to show you that you know that the journey is so strange sometimes where you know you you kind of find that like it, through doing all that data analysis you kind of came to this conclusion where you're like dude the data matters but only the right data matters and we need to make the most impact with with the fastest, you know, swiftest, um, simplest uh, approach. Uh, but what I wanted to ask you about was mental clarity. This was something that you mentioned on Twitter. Mental clarity and being a founder, um, radical ownership and responsibility. So, so being a founder, being an entrepreneur, so to speak, uh, you know, it, it, it's this radical. Uh, in your own words, radical ownership and radical responsibility that you're taking. And I'd love to just, just kind of hear your final thoughts on that, you know, before we start to wrap up and just yeah. um, maybe give everybody a little, you know, listening, if they're, they're sort of early stage, maybe they just got an idea and they're just getting going. Um, g give them a little bit of, of your perspective on sort of what it means to be an entrepreneur, uh, what it means to take that radical ownership and, uh, you know, the, the positives and the negatives of it and just kind of maybe, you know, a lot, I think a lot of people kind of glamorize this stuff and I, I'd love to hear your raw thoughts on it man yeah well i'll be truthful right being a nine to five and being a business owner if you are still an entrepreneur at heart is not much different like and here's the thing everybody gets into business and like oh i'm on, i'm my own boss that's the farthest thing for the truth you know who my boss is like the hundred and so clients that we serve yeah that uh, mic drop right yeah you quit a nine to five with one boss to go start a business with a hundred different bosses like Good luck with yeah. that because it's extremely yeah. challenging. But the one thing I'd say about radical ownership, I, I wake up in the morning and I'll even give you examples. I'm as blunt as can be and transparent. Uh, later today at 1.30 p.m., we got a call with a, with a client, not necessarily unhappy or happy. Project kind of got misaligned. They had a lot of stuff going on, didn't communicate clearly. We took some guesses, just didn't work out. You know, and if you run a project-based company long enough, it happens. You get it. Yeah. You fix it. Right. I don't right. wake up and blame. Like I, I don't even get to anymore. I don't get to wake up and blame the client. I don't get to wake up and blame someone else on the team. I don't get to hide in my corner because I'm not the boss. But radical ownership means I go in there, schedule, call, and change it. We fix it. We get to the bottom of it. We schedule thirty minutes and solve it. Right. I get to do that as the owner and the founder. That's the radical ownership. Man, if a problem arises, you solve it. If a solution arises, you don't get the credit for it. Your team does. And that's why it, being an owner or founder is so hard because, you know, as you were growing up, right, you had your mom and dad, you go play your soccer game, you score a couple goals, mom and dad gives you a pat on the back, tells you to do a great job. You know, as a founder, man, I don't get that. Yeah. You, you, no, yeah. One, no one's there to pat you on the back. So as you talk about that mental clarity and the radical ownership, the ownership is what you have to track in day in, day out. Did I take full ownership of my responsibilities today? Did I do everything in my power that I could? Did I leave any problem out to see or did I take full responsibility to solve it? And you may not be the one to solve it, right? Like if a, if a problem comes up with our business manager, I identify it because it comes in my email. Our CMO is going to go take care of that, handles it. He's going to report back when it's done. That's ownership to solve the problem. So that's just one thing, man, that I think a lot of people really need to understand that. I don't care if it was your fault or not. I don't care if you love or hate this client. I don't care if you love or hate your internal team member. Go solve the problem. That's all That's all that business is, right? How quickly can you solve problems and how efficiently can you get, can you get back to level or even go above? And that's why I think we've been so successful. 
look, man, I mean, we're, we're pitching websites. You know this. It's like one of the most competitive industries at times, not because so many people market themselves well, but I, admittedly, our deal sizes can go five to $25,000. You can go on Upwork and buy a website for literally a hundred bucks. They mean yeah. another industry to where that is the, the delta between two competitors. It's a hard industry to market yourself in and sell yourself in, right? That's right. I, I don't get to wake up and not assume responsibility for those questions, but I also have to assume that, you know, the responsibility to make ourselves stand out, right? So that's just where a lot of people, you know, they, they get into this and they let the market decide too many variables and affect too many variables to their success. But if you want to go make a million dollars, go figure out what that is a month and take ownership to put the systems in place to go make it happen, right? Um, and it's going to help you in other parts of your life as well, right? The, the easy example, if you're not happy about the way you look, you go work out. You take ownership to walk yourself to the gym and go make it happen. No one else does. And I think in business, it gets a little little fuzzy because there's different players and different variables. At the end of the day, especially if you're a founder right. of a small team, you are your business. You take sole responsibility for the business. Your Numa Media for a long time was David Riggs, just kind of behind Numa Media, right? Now we got a team and it's right. changing and things are growing, but every team member now has radical ownership, radical responsibility. They have to go own their problems and solutions. Um, and I think another thing hidden in there as well that I would say, uh, don't create problems, create solutions. Our, our best employees and my CTO, my co-founder, love them to death and he does a great job at this. There's a problem in the business. I do not hear about it until he has a solution and I know how much it costs and the next steps. So it's like, yeah. you know, I'll get a message. Hey, our backups broke on this server. We need to buy a new server. I found this computer that I can buy. It's going to take me two weeks to set up and it's 250. All I do, check mark in Slack, sold, done, over. I think that's the type of thing to ownership of problems. I do not care if you find a problem. That is a good thing that you found a problem. Go solve it. I don't need to know that you found a problem. I don't need to know that something's broken over there until you actually have a solution to solve it. So I think that ties into it as well. And then mental clarity, man, that's a, we could go another whole hour on it. Uh, yeah. One thing I'd say, though, is that I have it written up here. It's a book. What's the one thing I can do such that by doing it, everything else will become easier, entirely unneeded. It's from the one thing, the actual book. The mental clarity on that is really good. You got to take your ego out of it, your perspective out of it, your bias out of it, and everything. You have to look at that question. What is the one thing that I can do daily that's going to make everything else easier, and entirely unneeded? Zero to one, one to 10, 10 to 50. That's going to change every single day. Right. Zero to one for me, it was literally cash. Can I make the business survive? That's all I was doing. One to 10 now is, okay, how can I make my team members the best versions of themselves and continue to help them grow and be a better person? Product market fit, strategy, marketing, all those things come into play. So I think mental clarity on that and then that radical ownership of the two. I'm big on right now just because of the way the business is going and growing and things like that. But it's one of those things, man, I wish somebody would have beat it into me that you don't get an award for finding a problem. You really don't get an award for finding a solution. Um, you, you get an award for a successful business. And the only thing that happens in a successful business is people find problems and then find their company solutions as well. That's amazing, man. It's amazing. It's a great, great point of view. And I think uh, for every everybody listening, I mean, take take these words to heart, man. This is not, you know, this this is not your uh, your 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 college marketing class here. You know, this is this isn't your MBA program, man. This is like, you know, this is you, you probably just can assimilate more from this podcast than you could from four four years in an institution. So yeah, that that's really what it comes. Oh, well, seriously, I mean, that's what it comes down to, man. And I think again, it all. I want to kind of wrap that all the central themes that I'm that I'm feeling, which is number one. You know, take take. I mean, radical responsibility and all this stuff is all about relationships. It's all it's all about relationships. Everything you just said is pretty much about a relationship. It's a relationship to yourself. It's about understanding yourself and your. Um, your your organism and your ecosystem and what you need to be doing. It's about understanding your teammates and having a relationship with your team members and treating them with respect and and uh, and also holding them to a high standard, which is good for them in the long run and and all these kinds of good things. It's about uh, having a good relationship with your clients. It's about good, having a good relationship with your partners. It really all comes down to just being a human being, having good relationships, you know. And and all the marketing you're talking about, the, the marketing you're talking about is the same thing. It's like writing great content that resonates with another human being. It's like, I think in business and especially starting out, you know, that zero to one, it's like uh, zero to $1 million a year. It's like, man, people kind of, you know, they just, they just think they need to figure out these mechanisms and then they're just going to make tons of money. But really it all comes down to people. And, um, you know, I see a lot of like, you know, guys who are trying to, you know, get in 
getting clients and they're doing like cold email campaigns and they're sending these really stuffy, you know, hello, sir, or madam, you know, it, it feels that way, right? Maybe it's not like that bad, but it's, it feels that way. It's like, yeah. hello, you know, I do this and I can help you with this and we can two X your revenue. And, that, and you're like, man, dude, you gotta, you gotta get a little more human with this thing, put a joke in there or, you know, li liven it up a bit because you're dealing with people and, and whether they're at a fortune 10 company or whether they're, you know, a, a plumber down the street, man, they're, they're people, they got sense of humors. They, they watch TV shows they with their family and they, they like movies. They like music, they you know what I mean? And it all comes down to that at the end of the day is just making an impact by actually building these relationships and maintaining these relationships with the macro goal of what you're talking about, zooming out, you know, two, three, five, ten 10 years and going, I've built a successful business here. Um, yep. by my definition of success, right? What, what, your, your definition of, of success, but to... right. You haven't burnt bridges in the process. And this is one thing, my, ca my caveat on Twitter, but I'm still on it and active and starting to post content. Man, a lot of people on here see, seem like they're going to burn their perception for a quick buck. That is the worst way to go yep. make your million, right? Here's the thing. I'm not going to build websites forever, man. I, like it's not going to be long until I get into something new or, or try something new or go buy a business and keep Numa and do something else. Right. Like your, your perception and who you are and the relationships that you have with people is actually the, that, that is, uh, not the outcome of business. Business is the outcome of that, right? Like if you do that well, right. you will have a successful business. It's not a successful business brings vice versa. So I think that's the one thing, you know, keep that, keep the relationship strong. And this is just a simple, again, yeah. a lot of people think success has to be hard. It doesn't. If you piss somebody off, go call them and say, sorry, own your own, whatever you did wrong. And I was listening to a podcast this morning, man, and I thought it was said beautifully and I'll say it and we'll end because we could keep going, but, or maybe we'll keep going. Who knows? Uh, uh, it, it was this story of somebody that was like abused by his dad, right? And not to go dark, but struggled as a kid, you know, dad was an alcoholic, beat him time and time again. And he was so mad as an adult. And he talked to a therapist and the therapist was like, okay, can you not own any responsibility in this situation? Because not, like, do you not hear me? My dad used to beat me. And he's like, no, no, like, can, can you not hold any responsibility in the solution? He goes, you know, maybe I take 2%. And the, the therapist is like, cool, go own 100% of your 2%. Go to your dad and apologize. You know, he did that and they're literally, they're tight, so to speak, to this day. Like they, they've gotten over it, they've apologized, they've given each other forgiveness, they're good. And I think that's so powerful in the sense of, can you own the 100% of your 2%, even if it is 2%, right? Like if you made somebody mad and it really wasn't your fault, go own the 0.7% that you could have done better and bring that to the table because the other person is going to reciprocate that as well. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's that's heavy stuff, man. Um, really, really good way to end it, I think, honestly. That's, that's like uh... – yeah, just and and I love what you said about the it's it's sort of like being in the process as well, man. What you just said uh, before was just kind of you know live li you know build those relationships to have an outcome that is a successful business. To think that yeah, I, I love I love the way you're thinking about it, man. I, I think we could go on for forever. I think what we should we do though <laughs> is do a next podcast. I think maybe in you know in a couple months we we sort of check in again, man. That would be really fun and kind of see where you're at then and see how uh, your perspective have changed, see how the CRM has changed, see how anything has because uh, it seems like you're a dude on the move and things are constantly Try changing, it, man. man. Try it, yeah, yeah. We, why we didn't I, get the chat? We didn't even get the chat SEO and why I think uh, traffic is a terrible metric to track. We, we could go. We let, could let's do that let's talk about that real quick. Let, <laughs> zoom in on SEO and the yeah. traffic, man. We have no time limit here. No, yeah. we don't. Um, so SEO, man, right? You, you, you've been in the space, so you know, everybody's like, oh, organic traffic's up 17%. Same thing comes back to this dark funnel, right? Why is a top of funnel metric the right thing? And I'll see a bunch of people, and I audited a friend of mine's site who went with another agency, foolishly, admittedly, and they were ranking for these weird, weird, weird terms, man, that were driving traffic that had no, uh, no relevancy whatsoever to their offer. And I see that in a lot of sites. Hey, we bumped your traffic 10X. Okay, what were conversions? Uh, we bump traffic to next. Then again, what are conversions? And they're like, no, no, no. Like, did you see? We, we put these keywords on the first page. It, it, what it comes down to, I think a lot of people see SEO as like a method to rank or a method to get traffic. SEO is a method to generate revenue. Like a podcast is a method to generate revenue. Like LinkedIn is a message or a method to generate revenue. It all comes back to how it's going to impact the business, right? So for us, SEO, we have a couple clients. I actually dropped their traffic like by 10%. Their revenue, their revenue inbound mm. on just organic leads doubled. Why? Because I cannibalized the crappy keywords. We went straight after the keywords that mattered and we doubled down. 
you really only need five to 10 good keywords to have a good SEO campaign. You don't need, you know, like yeah. Apple will rank for a couple hundred thousand or whatever. Like that's great because it's Apple. You know, if I was Apple's SEO team, what are the seven keywords that actually work? Let's quadruple down on those. The other ones will come with time as SEO works, right? But like, that's one thing where, you know, we'll compete against SEO firms are like, well, hey, this other firm bumped this firm's traffic by 30%. Like, cool, you know, why does that matter to you? Like, are, are you excited to see extra traffic with no visitors or with no conversions? Like, we, we almost yeah. have to reframe it in the sense of SEO is not a, the outcome of SEO is not traffic or ranking keywords. The outcome is revenue. And that's where, like, we have, um, that, that same client, we dropped their traffic, went after a keyword with 20 visitors a month with no keyword difficulty that doubled their inbound leads uh, and inbound revenue as well, because it was just the right keyword that had intent, long tail, and it worked. I'm not going after keywords and things like that. And even on the website side of things, I'll say this too. The day I win a website design award is the day I quit this agency. I do not want to win a web design award because those designs on yeah. like awards.com honestly suck when it comes to conversions. They're flashy, yeah. they're slow, they're all over the place, they don't make sense. The day I win one of those is the day I'm in trouble. Same thing goes with SEO. The day You're I start correct. talking about quadruple traffic is the day that I'm doing SEO wrong. So that's where you know people will be like, oh, I got my client on the first page of Google in the first ranking. I am not impressed. What? Like show, show me the intent that comes from that. Show me the time on site. Show me the conversions through that blog. Okay. If you can show me that, then you're solid. So that's my little SEO right, man. I've been in this. That's been huge. Hey, that's months. huge. That's yeah. huge, man. And again, I think it's coming back to to simple levers that make a big impact. I, I, it's again another. And th these are becoming like David Riggs isms. Here. These are Riggs isms. I'll call them right now on the podcast for everybody. You know, follow this man. By the way, uh, get this dude on Twitter. D William Riggs, two G's. Uh, get follow this man on Twitter because you know this. I have to say one thing. I'm really it's really standing out about this too, and that I think a lot of the younger listeners and um you know regardless of age really but just you know younger in the in the journey of like becoming an entrepreneur i gotta say the conviction um and you know we talked about chris walker a little earlier we talked about jay abraham we talked these 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 kind of like pillars right now i, I would call chris walker a pillar somehow he's he's become he's really yeah. saying some interesting shit and jay abraham's a, a legend obviously but yeah. you know these, these kind of guys where you're speaking with absolute conviction on this and you are speaking on things that actually make an impact and you're not uh, regurgitating what, you know, some other SEO said, because frankly, I, again, not, not, no hate towards anybody, no, no disrespect, but I see a lot on Twitter, Facebook. I've been around the space a long fucking time and I've seen so many screenshots where we drop, we increase the traffic doing, right? It's this, this hockey stick of, of, of SEO, you know, and, and you're going cool or look at, we ranked first uh, for this keyword and they're showing the screenshot on their screen in their uh, geography showing yeah. this number one <laughs> thing and you're going, yeah, okay. Anybody that really knows SEO is going, dude, that that's not number one in every geography, right? It's that's just your local computer where you've been doing all the optimization. So it's it's like um, you know, it's this flash in the pan kind of um, you know, doing what every other SEO agency and person has done, right? And sort of like bragged about. And and what you're talking about with pure conviction in, in your voice, which I appreciate so much, is your own point of view. Uh, that that you didn't take from someone else, which is, look, like this is all about impact. Like the partner program comes down to impact. Yeah, finders fees are cool. I agree with you. Finders fees are fucking awesome. But <laughs> what you're doing is taking that to another like uh, threshold. You know, another another place where it's not good enough though. It, there's more to this than that. There's impact that can be made here on revenue on the quality of clients, huge one that people overlook. Good God, oh, I mean, if you're an agency. Qual quality content brings quality clients, man. If you have a crappy site with crappy SEO, with crappy intent, you are gonna be shuffling through the worst leads you've ever seen oh, in your life. Good God, you're gonna have these people <laughs> going, I need SEO. And, and you're like, fuck, man. Uh, so what? What do you? What do you? Why do you need SEO? Ah, because uh, but you know, you get these like real general weird. Yeah, no, it's just too weird, man. And I think yeah. you know, this is this is so deep. I think for anyone listening, man, especially getting going, like you know, this is. And I've seen a couple guys. I've met with a couple guys. Obviously, not naming names, but I met with a couple dudes. They're talking about 
um, outsourcing content, outsourcing content. Mm-hmm. I know this, this is hurting your ears right now. You're like, it fuck me. Yeah. So because, I mean, here, and here's the thing to be truthful. You can outsource parts of SEO. If you give good training, backlinking, you can outsource. If you give the terminology and the structure, right? Yes. Content, you got to hold to your chest, man. You can't outsource content. Good Lord, man. I mean, out this, this term outsourcing content, it just, it, I know it just gives me a headache when I hear it. Cause I'm like, dude, <laughs> like you would outsource the, authority that you are creating in the marketplace that's going to be driving yep. you know not t- not funnel middle of the funnel and bottom of the funnel too right this is like you're you're outsourcing your entire brand ethos to somebody for five dollars an hour or whatever i mean this is just this is heinous this is sacrilegious and uh and and yeah i i've seen this more than i i care to uh to uh, to admit honestly and and yeah of course backlinking those kind of things please outsource those things i mean unless you've got someone on the team that's you know i, I, I you know have to do that right um and, and you know what i mean and there, and there are those folks man and they just they just go out there they love researching they're part you know they're, they're part of that system but uh yeah man the content right close to the chest and i think everyone listening right now uh it is such a trend right now to outsource content to um, sometimes English is a second language folks, which no, no disrespect towards them at all. And I hope all those people prosper, but good fucking Lord, if you are serious about your brand, serious about SEO, serious about the traffic and the quality that you're getting, you know, keep that stuff close to your chest. And what, what's your thoughts on keyword research real quick? I, I'd love to hear that because, uh, that's also like a highly disputed thing. Uh, people do this keyword research, right? And this is like a black box term. Like, I'm gonna go do keyword research, David. Uh, you paid me three G's, David. I'd like to go do <laughs> keyword research now. And they're like, uh, cool. What, what's your thoughts on kind of like the mechanics of keyword research or whether writing like from your heart and, and what what's the, cause they're, you know, like the things you're saying with conviction right now, I don't know that they would rank that well in SEO. Like, for instance, like when you're talking about the impact of SEO, yada, yada, I don't know that that's going to be like on the first page tomorrow, but the content is so powerful that if it's distributed in the right way, it actually could. So anyway, I have your thoughts on sort of keyword research and that sort of aspect. Yeah. Well, I even say SEO, right, as we talk about it, it is a it is a form to create content. It's not about ranking or not about traffic, right? It's a way to create content. And then the, the it begs the question, okay, why do you need that content? Because your website is your ecosystem. It's the same reason Apple has some of the coolest physical retail stores imaginable. It's the same thing Tesla has some of the coolest physical retail stores imaginable. It creates an impression, right? And as you get to Tesla, you can, you know, the content there, you can engage with the cars and things like that, right? Like it's cool, it's engaging, it's fun. This is where I think social and Instagram and Twitter and TikTok are at right now will do a much better job of just garnering straight traffic to your website. So it begs the question of SEO isn't about just traffic and keywords. It's about, oh, oh wait, it's about good content on the site. It's about understanding top yeah. of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel, answering customer questions and prospect questions, building things in that are easily read on mobile devices. So they're short under 300 words because that's how people engage stuff now. Let them engage with the same stuff on your website, right? Really good example, this podcast, I'll send it to our writer. I'll probably turn this into 10 mini blogs, 300, 400 words, maybe throw some keywords in there and things like that. But the goal of it is once they read on your website to keep them on your site in terms of time on site and keep them around. So as I think about keyword research to go all the way back, I try not to get the really long stuffy ones and stuff them into a blog unless the site admittedly has no keywords present. Like it is brand new, zero search traffic, zero keywords. It, that writing's not gonna be perfect, but we gotta do something to get some keyword density up to get this site moving and we can move away with that over time. And, and that's what we've done for a couple of clients. The one where I said I dropped their traffic cannibalize a few keywords, triple down on the set of keywords that we wanted to. We had some kind of stuffy-ish blogs, but we bumped their visibility for those. And then we wrote other good content on the site, kept people on the site, time on site, and they converted. So all that he said, keyword right. research, I find the stuff that people hint are actually saying, right? Some of these keywords that people come up with, I've never heard someone write down or tweet or say or anything. Like I've never, there's a keyword I'm thinking about on, on one of my friend's site. It made no sense. No one would ever say it in their entire world, but Simrush said it had 150 search volume with a 12% KD. Great. That's a great one, right? No one's going to say that. So I try and find something oh. that people actually search or that, you know, and you, you've done SEO that you can like work into a phrase that fits. So like mobile app developer is, is a decent keyword, depending on your area. And if you're going to do location tags and stuff like that, you know, why you should trust a, a, a decade worth of experience in mobile app development. 
That's a phrase yeah. that people is going to say, right? They're not going to yeah. say it. I won't say it because it'll give it away. This other weird niche long form keyword that I've never seen anyone search or right. talk about in my life. Right, so I right. Think keyword research is good to set the North Star, right? And it's almost, and I tell clients this and, and prospect this, keyword research is good. We want to pick keywords that if you were to hand them into Google as the only things you could be known for, you want to be known for these items, right? That's really what keyword research is, but it's not like every single sentence has to have that keyword in it. You ultimately want to make sure that it's looped in and that your keyword density is correct, but not at the, uh, dis- I guess not the dispute, but like not at the fault of time on site. Those two things are going to go hand in hand. I think time on site is a far more important statistic now and growing into the future than anything else is. Because again, Google, I see Google is no different than a social platform. One that's used differently, but Google is Facebook to me, right? Google wants people to use their platform. If they're just sending you some crappy keyword stuffed articles that, you know, 400 words and 180 of them are the keyword, they're not going to send you anymore. They want people to use their product and platform. So they're going to send you good articles and they're I think they're going to more heavily look at time on site in the future, which is why my gut comes back to this again. Write good content, see good business results. Use SEO as a methodology to understand the types of content you write and how you're going to distribute that broadly speaking across the web. I love it, man. I love it. And I think, you know, that one one sort of point that you're making there is is make it natural, make it natural as well. Like, you know, and I I think that's something that people overlook, you know, they tend to uh, they tend to over again, they, they, they put data before actual uh, you know, actual readership or whatever. There he is. There he yeah. is. We finally this got is, him. This is I, know, I was hoping old. we would get him, man. Oh. I, you know, you, you built it up, man. And we didn't, we didn't, we didn't, we, we didn't see it. Oh, there and we he'll, go. He'll sit with me until the end. This is the, the six month old I just got. His name's Duke. And you're going to see the other one come behind me. He's the two year old shepherd mix. He's getting jealous. We got some jealousy going on here. Some, some rivalry, oh, yeah. sibling rivalry. Well, that's so wonderful, man. One, I think that's, this one's about 30 good. pounds. You'll laugh at this. And he's a pretty big dog. He's 30, 35. Tex, come here. Uh, okay. Come here. This one's 75 pounds. Oh, good Lord. Yeah, that he's dude's huge. head is bigger than your head, my friend. He's huge, man. He's huge. Oh, man. For anyone listening on audio, we got some really beautiful, we got some beautiful dogs here entering the, you know, they, they heard about to, the, uh, they were hearing about keyword to... research and they just had to jump in, man. They had to jump in, man. They're going to, they, they just want their dog bones. As long as that's a keyword that they get into there, they'll be happy. <laughs> Treat keyword, keyword, keyword boy, yummy boy. dog bones. Uh, <laughs> wonderful, man. Wonderful. Well, cool. I think we, I think we've covered a lot here, man. And I think definitely we we'll do this again and we'll kind of check in with you later on. I think that it's just like, uh, this is so valuable for everybody listening. I mean, we've covered so much here. We've covered, you know, rat everything from radical ownership to, you know, simple levers pulling big impact. We've, we pulled in some, some SEO stuff, which I think is so important. Um, I think, you know, my, my advice to people always, because they're always asking me, hey, man, should I do outreach or should I start writing content? I'm like, both. <laughs> do it now. Yeah. Start, start And start coming up with your convictions, man. That's one thing I really that stood out to me about this entire uh, interview is just like, you know, your, your, your convictions are really strong because you are seeing results in certain ways and you're not just judging on data but you're judging on actual conversations with your clients and, and that relationship that you're building so it's it's really high impact stuff that, that we're talking about here that isn't uh just you know isn't just the same stuff that everyone's repeating frankly and and i, I really really appreciate that from you so i'm gonna wrap it up by oh yeah yeah no so i'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap it up uh, uh by saying that first off follow uh d william riggs r-i-g-g-s um, D William Riggs on Twitter, uh, go, go follow this man immediately. It's a, it's a very, very valuable follow. Again, if you don't want to see the same, you know, plat- uh, stuff you're seeing a million times on Twitter, this guy will kind of like freshen up your timeline a bit, which I really appreciate uh, from you I, on, I on my end too. Very inspiring. I promise I will tell you to wake up at five and, and meditate for two hours. <laughs> Well, you, you tell us whatever you want, but I, I know you'll have conviction behind it and, and you'll actually be, you know, doing it. So that that's the most important thing about it. But uh, but that's great, man. And so and so, yeah, anything else you want to promote here? Please tell us, man, where can we go find you? Where can you know if someone wants to hire you, where do they go hire you? If someone wants to just, you know, join the partnership program? I know a lot of I mean, this sounds like an opportunity for folks there too. you know, just to to, uh, to to boost their own business. Again, we're talking about strategic partnerships. We're talking about building relationships. So drop it, man. And uh, and we'll, we'll go from there. Yeah. So uh, if Twitter, D. William Riggs, LinkedIn, if you just search David W. Riggs, you'll find me as well. Um, Instagram, I'm starting to get active on as well, which is also D. William Riggs. Um, if you all want to hire us, so to speak, I encourage you to go get what we call a free assessment. So go to Numa. 
P N E U M A L L C dot co. Uh, in the top right, there's going to be a massive button that literally says get a free assessment. Go book one in. You're going to chat with myself and our CRO. And literally, even if you have no intent on uh, from purchasing from us and you have questions on SEO or websites or whatever, or you just want to talk to us and, and you have some ideas or whatever, man, go click in, go book a call. It's 30 minutes. We would be happy to chat with you, point you in the right direction if we're not the right fit, or just give you free insight, right? It, it truly is a get a free assessment. If you're interested, we'll tell you what everything costs by the end of the call. If you're not interested, you won't hear a single thing about it. We're just going to give you the most insight as possible. And then other than that, we just added a free training to the website. Uh, it's like 20, 25 minutes long. It's the, the three parts of our core model of website design, website development, and content and SEO. So as you think about building your own site, uh, if you go to our website, I believe the free training is linked in the footer. It literally just went live the other night. So if it's not, uh, someone tweet at me or I'll go check right after this call. But the free training would be a great way to get some initial uh, initial insight into what we do and who we are. And then outside of that content, we, uh, we're trying to produce more content than a $100 million firm, uh, which means we're posting a lot. But go check out, uh, you know, our full team is really active on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter as well. So our CMO, our CRO, our CTO are all on those three platforms. Uh, but feel free to check out the podcast um, and just stay in touch. We're going to be launching more stuff. If you're interested in the partner program, uh, my email is david at numallc.com, not .co. So feel free to email me and just put partner program and we'll get you set up. All right, David. Well, thank you so much, man. And uh, yeah, to, to drive that home again, guys, he's got free training that you can go check out that'll give kind of his methodology that with true conviction he has laid out for us today to to a to a uh, small extent. I think there's obviously going to be more in there. And uh, and man, he's offering a free assessment if you want to speak to this dude and actually get some insights. So um, if you don't take up, you know, if you don't take him up on that offer, I guess it's, it's it's on you. Take that radical responsibility and ownership for not doing not doing that but uh, I do highly recommend especially if you're getting into the website space if you're getting in the SEO space uh, these are great spaces man and they're they're only getting better in my opinion because of all of the things we say that you know a lot of people are just not doing it correctly uh, there's a lot of sort of hearsay and weird stuff flying around about these industries that uh, frankly just isn't true, especially with the modern B2B buying journey the way that it is. You know, putting an email pop up on your site is not going to uh, increase sales, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, unless you're talking about uh, some kind of real, you know, specific e-com case or something like that. But uh, yeah. I, I think either way, I think that there's there's a lot of uh, a room in this space. There's a lot of room for growth in this space. I think a lot of people are um, you know, are just fit to, to jump into this. So meet with David, you know, book that, that free assessment, get in touch with these guys. Um, God, huge opportunity, man. Thank you for presenting that obviously. And thank you of for course, every insight you dropped on this interview, dude. I'm really, I'm super impressed. And I think everybody listening, man, listen to this a few times and just kind of zoom in on what uh, David is saying, man. Cause it's, man, I, uh, it's I appreciate real shit. that. I appreciate that for sure. Thanks for having me on. I love doing this stuff. Um, I, yeah, I, I was going to say, see, Twitter, Twitter's paying its benefits. Andre's been telling me to get on Twitter for like months now. And I was like, all right, I'll tweet a couple of times. And then uh, arguably, honestly, this may, uh, you let me ramble a bit, which is good. It might be the best podcast I've done in a while. So I'm super up, excited. Man? I'm going to pass this to the video team and uh, we'll get some good reels and stuff like that and just distribute it. Awesome. Like Awesome. I'll be doing the same. So let's see how let's slice it up, get some people some insights. And ah, I think honestly, man, some huge impact stuff. I mean, we talked about huge impacts and this this one will have a huge impact, I think, on people getting going. So thank you again, David. I'll, uh, I'll cut it off here. You guys go check out Numa, P-N-E-U-M-A, L-L-C dot co. Go check out D. William Riggs with two G. And you guys have a great day. And thanks for tuning in. All right. I really hope you enjoyed that. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Always Building. Uh, if you want to learn more about Always Building, our community, our membership group, uh, and uh, exclusive webinars and trainings and discounts on software and all kinds of fun stuff, you know, get help along the journey so you're not all alone uh, in this whole thing, um, go ahead and check out alwaysbuilding.io. That's alwaysbuilding.io. And again, thank you so much. Um, Best of luck on your journey. And you just let me know. You can reach out to me uh, on Twitter or via email, alex at alwaysbuilding.io uh, or at always underscore building uh, on Twitter. Okay, thanks again. Have a great one.